Hello everyone. Today we are going to discuss the laboratory investigations for rutting of bituminous mixtures. So this is the outline of this lecture. I will give you an outline about uh, the development of asphalt mixture performance test. What is the motivation for that? And then uh, we will be discussing two mixture performance tests such as one is a flow time test and second one is a flow number test. How the specimen is to be prepared for this test? What are the uh, testing uh, pr uh, protocols and what are the post, post processing techniques? All those will be discussed in this lecture. And also we will see what is the uh, failure criteria as far as rutting is concerned is uh, determined based on these tests. So let me give you an overview of uh, what is the background of development of these asphalt mixture performance test. As we all know, we design bituminous mixtures in India and in many other countries. We follow the Marshall method of mix design. Okay? The basic concept of Marshall method is that you select the aggregates and the binder uh, for a particular mixture, say bituminous concrete or bituminous macadam and then we look at the volumetrics of these mix. When I say volumetrics, it means the voids in mineral aggregate, voids filled with uh, bitumen, voids in the mixture, all these parameters will be looked into after casting a specimen using the uh, aggregate and the binder with different binder contents with a compactive effort given using the Marshall compactor. Okay? Then for the prepared mix, then you see what is its stability and flow. So these are the two parameters that you will uh, see to determine what is called as the optimum binder content for the mix. So in this case, the optimum binder content is decided based on a target air voids, say 4 percentage and considering the volumetrics of the mix and also the stability and flow of the mix which is determined using the Marshall apparatus. Okay? But in this case, uh, what is lacking is that the stability and flow are not directly correlated to the strength of the mix or uh, the property of the mix to resist deformation such as rutting, fatigue, etc. is not captured using such uh, parameters such as stability and flow. So understanding this, and to be used along with a mechanistic empirical payment design, this super pave method of mix design was developed uh, by the strategic highway research program. And in super pave method of mix design also the volumetric path remains more or less the same. But uh, the main aspect is that the properties of the binder as well as aggregate is linked together in this mix design procedure. You use PG graded binders and then the compactive effort that is given to the mixture to prepare the specimen is also changed to mimic what is actually happening in the field. So you cast specimens in the super pave mix design using the super pave gyratory compactor wherein a shear compaction is given in the specimen. Uh, which reflect more or less the kind of compaction that is happening when you lay and compact your bituminous mixture in the field. Okay? Based on this analysis, super pave method, you decide what is the optimum binder content. Uh, but then later, when this uh, mechanistic empirical design of payments was introduced, uh, they realized the fact that this, uh, uh, this method of mixed design also lacks any kind of uh, mechanical uh, test that will actually determine the performance of this material in the field. Okay? So in order to introduce that factor also or in order to capture the response of the material in the field, these asphalt mixture performance tests or simple performance tests were developed as part of the National Cooperative Highway Research Program. Okay? So in this program, three different tests were identified or and developed. One is the dynamic modulus test. And the second one is a static creep test which is called the flow time test. And the third one is a repeated creep test or a repeated creep and recovery test. You call it as a flow number test. Okay? The first dynamic modulus test is related to the determination of dynamic modulus for this mixture which will be used in the design of flexible payments. 
whereas the other two tests which is the flow time test and the flow number test is related to the performance of the mixture as far as rutting is concerned. So, it is related to the rutting performance. So, in this lecture we will see what is a flow time test and the, what is a flow number test. So, for both these tests I will discuss what, how the specimen is prepared. Uh, the specimen is a cylindrical specimen of 100 mm diameter and 150 mm height. This is prepared as per the ASHTO protocol ASHTO PP60. You decide the mix, then you batch the aggregate first uh, as per the required gradation. Then you choose the binder and decide the binder content based on your uh, mix design and then the mixing of the aggregates and the binder is can be done either manually or you can do it in a mixer, mechanical mixer. Then you do a short term aging of the prepared mix uh, as per uh, ASHTO standards R30. This is a conditioning of say 4 hours at 135 degrees Celsius if you are using an unmodified binder say VG30 whereas if you are using a modified binder for this mix then you have to uh, choose the conditioning temperature as per the uh, manufacturer's recommendations. So, you will keep it in trays at small depths and this will be placed in the oven and conditioned for at least 4 hours ok. This aging of bituminous uh, binder as well as mixtures are uh, discussed in detail in Professor Nivita in her lecture. Uh, so, next is casting of the specimens. Now, this mixture will be cast uh, in cylindrical uh, specimens either in a super pave gyratory compactor or you can cast as slabs or prisms in a shear box. Okay. Then the required specimen will be cored and sliced to get the required dimensions. Now, the difference is that when you are using a shear box compactor, you can have a specimen of a larger beam size from which you can cut uh, specimens of at least three numbers of the required dimensions. Whereas, in the case of super pave gyratory compactor, the specimen is cast as a cylinder from which you can uh, core out only one cylinder for your test. So, this is uh, the picture showing a uh, uh, prism from which three specimens are cored out whereas this is a picture showing uh, a gyratory compacted specimen from which one cylindrical specimen is cored out and your final specimen size is 100 mm diameter and 150 mm height. Again this casting of specimen using a shear box as well as a super pay gyratory compactor is explained well uh, in the uh, lecture by Professor Murali. Now let us discuss first the flow time test, I will discuss what are the test protocols and how the data is processed. Flow time means a static creep test, when I say a static creep it is a static load which is applied on the specimen for a sufficient long time that is called a static creep test. Now this actually reflects uh, or uh, represents uh, the kind of loading of a stationary vehicle on your payment surface. Okay. Now, this protocol is taken from the National Cooperative Highway Research Project Report NCHRP 465 and this shows the test protocol. You can see this is time in the x axis and stress in the y axis. You apply a creep deviator stress, so this is a stress that you apply which is constantly applied on the specimen. Now, uh, it is very difficult to apply a certain stress suddenly on a, a specimen. So, it will take some time to reach that. So, this is the uh, time to reach uh, the required deviator stress, then that stress is kept constant. Okay. Now, for this uh, specimen you need certain amount of contact stress is to be given or a seating load has to be given. Normally, uh, 2 to 5 percentage of the deviator stress will be given as the contact stress. And also this, this test can be conducted in a confined condition or in an unconfined condition, I will come to that later. So, if the confinement pressure is given, so this marked here is the confinement pressure which is also a static compressive load on the specimen. So, this is the whole uh, loading uh, protocol. So, what you are looking at is, see here you have the stress which is constant over a period of time. 
you expect that the material behave in a ductile manner and it is well established that a ductile material responses in a three stage creep behavior. So, what you see here is a three stage creep response of a material. You can see time in the x axis and the creep strain or you can say it is a deformation strain or deformation is marked in the y axis. When you load a material suddenly, so here I have shown it as a sudden loading of sigma or sigma 0. When the load is applied suddenly, there will be a sudden instantaneous deformation in the material. So, this is marked here as the instantaneous deformation. Thereafter, what you can see is that there will be an increase in strain, but this will happen at a decreasing rate. So, in this region, you say that the strain is increasing, but the rate of increase of strain is actually decreasing and a point will be reached thereafter the increase in strain will be at a constant rate. So, here it is more or less at a constant rate and later on at certain stage will be reached when the strain starts increasing at an increasing rate. So, this is the third stage. So, these three stages you call it as primary, secondary and tertiary. So, in the primary stage there is a gradual increase in strain, then there is a constant increase, then there is a, thereafter there is a sudden increase in the strain. Now, uh, the definition of flow time is that the time period when the material starts flowing or it is the time when which the material the or shear deformation begins to happen in the material or you can say that when this tertiary stage begins, you say that the material has failed and that point is called as flow time for the specimen. So, what you see here is first is the time versus complaints is plotted here. When I say complaints, this is creep complaints which is the strain per unit stress applied. So, it is if epsilon t is the strain uh, at a time divided by sigma d is the deviatoric stress that you have applied that will give you the complaints or creep complaints. So, here creep complaints is in the y axis and time in the x axis. You see there is a primary stage, then the secondary stage and the tertiary stage is shown here. Now, you know that bituminous material is a uh, heterogeneous mix of an aggregate matrix and a bituminous mastic. Okay? Now, when it is loaded and it contains certain amount of air voids. So, when you load it during the initial stages there could be a rearrangement of particles or the deformation which will actually densify the material. So, there could be a change in the volume of the material. But after a certain point of time you see that the material flows without any change in volume. Okay? So, this is the stage where which the change in volume becomes 0 and that point corresponds to the flow time of the material. Now, how to determine this flow time is that from the creep complaints or creep strain uh, graph, you can find what is the rate of change of strain and you can identify that point which is the minimum rate of change of strain. So, you can see I will just plot the primary secondary stage in this bottom graph. Okay, so, in the primary stage, let this is the rate of change of creep complaints. I have marked it as D dot T. Okay, so, you, you know that as I said, the rate decreases as the load increase, uh, lo as the time increases. So, you can see that the rate, the rate goes down like this and in the secondary stage, it remains more or less a constant. And when it reaches the tertiary stage, it starts again increasing. Okay? So, this is the rate of change of strain. So, that point which is the minimum rate of change of strain or when the increase in strain happens, that point is marked as float time or Ft. Okay? You have to do the test at an air void of 4 or 6 percentage. This is what the protocol says. Now, why 4 and why 6? When I say 6 percentage, you know that you in the in the field you lay and compact a bituminous mixture to an air void of 6 to 7 percentage. So, if you have to represent that material in the laboratory, you have to test it at 6 percentage air void. So, when I test it at 6 percentage air void, what you can see is that there could be deformations due to densification in the material as well as there will be deformation due to shear. Whereas, if it is a 4% air void material, it is 
uh, it might have already reached its almost uh, refusal aeroid content. So, there will be less amount of densification in the material, there will be mostly shear deformation. Okay? So, depending upon what is that what you want to capture, you can do the test at a 4 percent or a 6 percent aeroid sample. Now, the temperature at which you have to do the test is, you can test it at any range of temperature from 25 to 60 degrees Celsius. But what the code says is that you should choose the effective temperature of the region in which you are going to use the material. When I say effective temperature, it is that one temperature which will give you the same amount of deformation in the uh, payment, uh, payment or in the material as if you have considered all the seasonal variations for a year. Okay? So, if I consider one representative temperature, that temperature is called the effective temperature. But what you know is that uh, during uh, lower temperatures, uh, the deformations that may happen uh, or rutting that will happen in a material will be very less because this is a high temperature phenomenon. At high temperature, the material will be less stiff and the chances of deformation will be more. So, uh, mostly your effective temperature will be the higher temperature prevailing in the region. So, you can uh, test it at say 50 or 60 degrees Celsius. Uh, suppose you are doing a uh, test for the Indian conditions. And the next aspect is that you can do the testing in an unconfined condition or a confined condition in the specimen. Now, why this is so? See, if I consider a payment structure, any element inside the payment layer, say, suppose this is the bituminous layer and in the bituminous layer, if I consider one element inside that, we know that it is not only subjected to a axial load, but it is subjected to stresses from all around or it is a three dimensional state of stress that is which the material is subjected to. So, suppose you want to reflect this in your test protocol, you have to do the test in the confined condition. When I say confined condition, you will be applying stress not only from the top, but from all around the materials will be subjected to stress. Okay? Now, the stress levels that you have to apply as per the test protocol is, in, if you are testing in the unconfined condition, you have to give a deviatoric stress or a design stress of 69 to 207 kPa. That is 10 to 30 psi, you can choose the load according to the kind of traffic that you are expecting in the field. And if you are testing in the confined condition, you can have a design stress of 483 to 966 kPa that is your 70 to 140 psi and the confinement you can give as 5 to 30 psi or it will be 35 to 207 kilopascal will be the uh, confinement pressure that you have to give how the material is uh, set up for the testing is shown in this figure. Uh, you can see that this is a loading frame. Okay? You apply the load uh, using a load cell and this load cell captures the load and this here is the specimen. Okay? The specimen is kept in between a bottom platen and a top platen and there are two hardened steel discs which are provided at the top and the bottom and it is through this disc that the load is applied uniformly on the specimen. Okay? And then to capture the deformation, the axial deformation, you use linear variable differential transducers or LVDTs. Okay? Now, what I have mentioned so far is the linear deformation of the material. Now, suppose you want to capture the radial deformation that also can be done by the use of radial LVDTs, okay? but uh, which will give you information about the Poisson's ratio of the material and all. Uh, but this may complicate, it will be highly complicated to collect information in the radial direction as well. So, what I am discussing here is the uh, collection of deformation in the axial direction alone. Okay? So, as you see here, this is your specimen. You will collect the deformation as I said using LVDTs. Now, uh, it is not that you will collect the deformation of the entire specimen because there could be end effects at the top and bottom. So, you will collect the deformation of certain gauge length in the middle of the specimen. So, the gauge length that we normally uh, provide is 100 mm. Okay? And again, the specimen deformation can be collected at 100 mm in the specimen. You use three LVDTs which are equally spaced that is at 120 degrees apart 
on the surface of this specimen so that any uh, variability due to uh, non-uniformity of the material or non-uniformity of the specimen will get cancelled out when you use three LVDTs. So, now how to fix the LVDTs onto this specimen? This is done using certain studs fixed on the specimen. So, as you can see in this figure, this is an apparatus wherein there are three holders in which what you see here is a stud and the stud glue is applied on the stud and this attached to the specimen so that all the six studs will get glued to your specimen. So, you can see here these are the studs which are glued to the specimen. So, for three LVDTs you have six studs in the specimen and in the uh, in this studs you will attach this which is your transducer mount. So, you have two transducer mounts one at the top and one at the bottom for one LVDT. Now, as you can see here this is a top mount and this is a bottom mount and this road here is the LVDT which is connected to the specimen and then to the data acquisition system. Okay. As I mentioned that you have you can do the test in the confined condition as well as in the unconfined condition. So, when I say confined test you have to apply a confining pressure from all around on this specimen. But since this is a specimen which contains air void inside that you have to cover it with a rubber membrane if you have to do a confined test. So, what you see here is that your entire specimen is covered with a rubber membrane and this, uh, this membrane is actually attached to the top platen as well as the bottom platen and it is fixed using o-rings so that there is no leakage through the top and the bottom platens. Okay? And another important aspect is that suppose you are doing a confined test. Uh, you want to have an atmospheric pressure to be maintained inside the voids of the specimen. So, what you have to do is that this has to be properly vented using see what the pipe that you see here is a venting pipe to keep the uh, air inside the uh, specimen in the atmospheric condition whereas, the pressure will be applied from all around. Now, what you see here is a asphalt mixture performance test apparatus. You can see there is a closed environmental chamber inside which the specimen is placed here and this is the top cover of the chamber which can be closed so that you can do the testing in a closed chamber and this is a data acquisition system. Now, the temperature of testing as I said has to be done at an effective temperature. Now, this is a specimen of size 100 mm dia and 150 mm deep and every point in this material has to reach the test temperature before you can do the testing. So, what you normally do is that if the uh, environmental chamber has sufficient space, you can keep a dummy sample along with your actual test sample. You can put a temperature probe inside the specimen, you can cut a groove and put a temperature probe inside that and note how much time it takes in the conditioning chamber for the specimen to reach the temperature and once it reaches, reaches the test temperature, you can remove the dummy sample out and you can do the test in the actual test specimen. If it is not possible then by trial and error you can determine how much is the time that is required for each specimen to reach the required uh, test temperature then only you will start the testing. Okay? And the contact load as I said is 5 percentage of the deviatoric stress or the static load and then when you apply the load what you are trying to achieve is this thing that is you have to apply a load or a stress instantaneously on the specimen, but this may not be possible because of the uh, equipment capabilities. So, in that case you have to apply it rapidly so that at least at 15 mega Pascal per second should be the rate at which you have to take the load. So, it will you, you will go like this and then the required stress will be reached. Okay? Now, you will continue this test till a time you see the tertiary flow in the material or a failure in the material by tertiary flow or till the axial strain reaches a value of 2 percentage. Okay? Now, if you are doing the confined test then you have to apply the pressure also that is the confinement pressure also. So, first you will keep the specimen then apply the confinement pressure again that is slowly applied. Once the confinement pressure is completely applied see here see this will be the confinement pressure that will be applied completely and then the deviatoric stress or the static load will be applied. Again the static load will be applied at the rate of 15 mega Pascal per second so that it reaches immediately on the specimen. 
and the confined test you will do it till a tertiary flow is reached as you can observe from the material or the material fails or up to an axial strain of 4 to 5 percentage. Now let us see how we process this data. So as I said what we are collecting is that we are applying a static load on the specimen and the creep in the material is being collected or you say the creep deformation. So what you are collecting is the deformation say delta ok. Now this deformation with time, this delta with time can be divided with the gauge length. So here the gauge length is 100 mm, you will get the creep strain ok. Either you can represent it in terms of creep strain or you can uh, represent it as creep compliance. So when I say creep compliance is its creep strain per the deviatoric stress. So what you see here is the creep complaints or it could be creep strain also either epsilon t or it is dt which is marked in the y axis and this is time in seconds which is marked in the x axis. So this is a typical output from the flow time test. You can see that this test continued till 1000 seconds and it has more or less followed a three stage creep behavior. First of all you will plot it in a log log scale. So it is much more easier to do the computation in a log scale. So this here is a log dt. So the strains or complaints are in the order of uh, 10 raised to minus 2 or minus 3 that is why these are negative values here in the log scale and here log time in the uh, x axis. So I have plotted uh, log time versus log complaints and then you identify various factors. One parameter as I said is the flow time and NCHRP has suggested several other parameters also to be identified from this uh, creep compliance curve. Let us see one by one. The first one is D0. D0 is called the instantaneous compliance or the compliance in, the, what is the compliance at the very first instant of load application. But uh, you can't take it at the zero time because as I said it will take some time for you to reach the required load application. Uh, so uh, for example if you have taken 50 microseconds to reach the load application consider the first point as say 100 microseconds. So you note what is the creep compliance corresponding to that first point which is denoted as at the time corresponding to 100 microseconds ok. So that is the instantaneous creep compliance and another one is the creep compliance at 1 second or it is actually in the log log plot where does the creep compliance curve intercept. So that value is called the creep compliance corresponding to 1 second. So when in, in the log scale this become as the 0th point. So where it intercept is this point. So this point corresponds to so this compliance value here or somewhere here this corresponds to D1 ok. So this is another parameter that you can estimate from the creep compliance curve. Now the next two parameters are m1 that is a slope and intercept of the linear portion of your creep compliance curve. So as I sh as drawn here, uh, the secondary stage of the uh, creep compliance curve if you can identify, just draw a tangent to that line, the intercept here is one parameter and the next is the slope of this straight line portion in the creep compliance curve. So these are the four parameters that you can estimate from the uh, creep compliance curve and the next one is the flow time. So in order to estimate the flow time as I said you have to get the creep rate of change of creep compliance. So what is drawn here in the y axis is d dot t which is the rate of change of creep compliance and time in the x axis both in the log scale. So this is also log scale. So how to get this uh, data is that uh, what you normally do is that identify one point every point in the uh, compliance curve take uh, two points to the left two points to the right. So you can have five data points corresponding to one time and then you fit a polynomial for that. So here at any time a polynomial at any data point you have five points to which a polynomial is fitted. You can use any regression tool to fit this equation. So a, b and c are the coefficients of this fitting. Then you take the rate of change. So it is dt by d, d small t which will be equal to b plus 2c ti 
where i corresponds to the ith position or the ith time so at every time point in the uh, in the creep curve so every point in the creep curve you choose five data points fit a curve and then take the rate so that will be uh, easier to uh, draw the creep complaint uh, rate of change of creep complaint so then you can plot this and you can identify where you get the minimum point okay so this point is here is denoted as the flow time there could be a problem that you may find many points which are lying at the same uh, with the same minimum value then what you can do is that you can choose certain points in and around the uh, minimum point and then fit another polynomial for that to identify the exact minimum value in this curve so that is how the processing is done so as i mentioned as in the nchrp study they have identified various parameters such as d0 d1 uh, slope of the linear portion intercept of the linear portion and the flow time so this many parameters were identified in the study uh, to find out which one mostly correlate to the performance of the material in the field so in order to get such an information it is required that you need field data okay or any other simulative test which can relate uh, which you can directly relate to the field performance okay so in nchrp study what they have done is that many accelerated loading facility studies test tracks ex studies were there all the information that is collected from this day uh, these test stretches were tried to be correlated with the flow time data that is captured in the laboratory on that particular mix okay and then correlations were tried to be established between these and it was identified that among all the parameters that we have estimated flow time is the one which is seem to be more correlating to the field rotting so this is one such correlation which is i have taken from the nchrp report as you can see that this is uh, from an alf accelerated loading facility test section and uh, as far as the material is concerned it was a confined creep test that was done or a flow time test that was done at 54.4 degrees celsius in the laboratory and the same mix which is used in the accelerated loading facility and the rut depth at 10000 passes of a wheel in the accelerated loading facility is tried to be correlated so it is flow time versus the rut depth at 10000 passes and the it was found to be very much correlating with each other or it is related to each other so uh, it was established that flow time is a better estimate of the rutting performance of the mixture in the laboratory